So what I want to present today is a presentation which I also gave last week. Um, but <laughs> Christian was a co uh, uh, okay with this. It was in Nantes. It was at the conference called Bio360. And uh, so I thought it was nice to give you an opportunity to, to listen in to the same presentation as I gave last week. It's about our 10 years ex experience in uh, biochar production uh, and uh, how we approach uh, scaling up. So uh, basically what to wish for then, what to aim at and what to choose as a subtitle. So let me introduce myself. I'm Rianne Vista. I work uh, 25 years for uh, the Netherlands Organization for Applied Research. Although 18 years of those, I worked at the Energy Research Center of the Netherlands, which uh, merged with uh, TNO. Within TNO, I'm in the Energy Transition Department, and uh, there are a number of locations. We're about an hour from Amsterdam, just to know you where you can find me. So within the energy transition, we work on processes and technologies bringing biofeedstock to bioproducts. And we usually operate between, say, the universities and the markets. We bring things all the way up to the market, but we're not a business. So we always have to find partners to bring our technologies to the market. So why the focus on biochar? I think it's very strange that there is so much emphasis on hydrogen these days, at least within Europe, within the Netherlands. Um, you hear all sorts of things about how the tropical rainforests are so important because they are the lungs of the world. It's all very true, but nobody ever talks about carbon. Well, maybe you, because you're working in biochar, but otherwise this is very strange. So carbon is also the backbone of life on Earth but it's also an important element in our fuels, our chemicals and materials. And the oxidation of carbon is an important factor in climate change. So I think it's in our, at least within our uh, community, well accepted that biochar storage and soil is one of the few economically viable options for negative CO2 emissions by which we can fight climate change. And it can at the same time improve the soil quality if you know what you're doing and you have a decent quality biochar, of course. But even better, maybe you may have versatile carbon products which can first be used and at the end of the life still be used for carbon storage. So that would be really be beneficial in my opinion. So then I use this very nice graph uh, picture that I found on the NASA website to show you the negative emission options in this carbon cycle, which is on the left side. And to put things a bit in perspective, here are the human emissions, which seem small, but they're still very relevant as they are, uh, you know, causing the climate change. Uh, part of this is already uh, absorbed by the extra photosynthesis, but how we can make this cycle prolong the period within uh, the soil is that we make the carbon actually more stable. So by stabilizing the carbon, we can prevent all fungi and bacteria of uh, breaking it down very quickly. And therefore, this, this period in soil is, in fact, more longer, longer, and therefore, you can talk of carbon storage. So it's a huge potential, and that is, I think, important to see. And um, it is recognized by the IPCC uh, within the EU, as of July 16th, I'll put on my pointer, so I can point two things. So um, July 16th, there will be biochar allowed to be used as soil improver in the fertilizer regulation. And um, so if you think this is a good idea, this is a potentially a negative emission we want to use to fight climate change, you have to go for larger volumes and to be able to apply large volumes, I think you have to cut down on the price. Of course, you could hope people are building high prices and still you be able to produce large volumes, but reality is usually that uh, people will only do this when it's cost effective. So what to aim for then? To lower the cost price and to increase the production volumes. Well, what we've come to conclude in the last 10 years is that you choose a technology that can be built at a larger scale. So for larger uh, production quantities and lower specific cost. So this has to be a technology which you can build an economy of scale. 
So you don't put six or seven or 10 or 50 of the same size installations next to each other, but you build one larger version, which then is cheaper per volume of biochar produced. The next thing you choose is preferentially a low clean residue as a feedstock. And there, uh, for instance, you can go to the sunflower husks or some wood residues or cocoa shells. Uh, anything that is sufficient volume and giving you quality biochar, but hopefully is not too expensive. Choose the technology and process conditions to allow for more than one product. That is especially uh, useful if you can make uh, bi uh, bioenergy, as the production of biochar releases the burnable gas, and this allows for this co-production of biochar and bioenergy. And if you can use, for instance, high uh, temperature steam, it can replace uh, natural gas, uh, a big thing these days. Yeah? You might avoid uh, buying some from the Russians. And um, you get two revenues at the same time, which you can stack, and therefore it's, it's more easily uh, economically viable. Or on the other hand, uh, more people might, might be willing to buy it. So choose a technology with well-controlled process conditions to produce a high valuable product at a constant quality. And especially this constant quality is very important. So if we go back to the recent paper of Le Lehman et al. 21, uh, saying that if you want a, a storing capacity from the biochar uh, over 100 years, which is also a number mentioned in LCA studies, um, then you better produce it over 600 degrees C. And this is then a precondition if you want the storage capacity for the future and hopefully also get carbon credits for it. So there's numerous ways you can use the biochar. Um, we've been working these past 10 years on uh, not ourselves, eh? the, the soil improvement is done, done by uh, uh, partners, uh, but we've been involved in numerous projects where we also replace the peat in potting soil in greenhouses. Uh, we've done some projects where uh, we use the, the biochar for filter application. Um, we're working together with a, a large steel company seeing if they could use it as a reducing agent for making uh, steel in, instead of uh, fossil cokes. And of course, there's the storage option and um, you could store it in soils, but also in construction materials. So there's many others. Um, these are the ones that we've been working on. So this is uh, an example of uh, the projects we've been doing between 2015 and 2021. Uh, it's replacing peat in potting soil or substrates, they call it in, uh, in that uh, uh, trade. Um, and here you can see uh, an SEM picture of a peat particle and a biochar particle. And you see the structures um, are very often alike. But the peat particle, of course, you can, can press like a sponge and the biochar particle you can. So there, there are differences as well. Um, but in the, the replacement, it's done a remarkable good job. Um, there has been tests with our agricultural partners, uh, very often the, the Wageningen Agricultural University in the Netherlands, but also with the Belgian partners and UK partners. Uh, there's been tests on chrysanthemum, which is, seemed to be an easy crop, uh, cyclamens, also uh, decorative plants, uh, but more critical, uh, lavender and all strawberries. And uh, it's easy to replace at least 30% peat in the potting soil uh, without any modification of operation. So based on the pH, uh, which is a critical for plants, of course, uh, you can replace 50%. And we've done trials with 50%, you manage, but then the grower needs to change a bit in his operation. And very often they don't like this. So with the 30%, they could um, operate as, as normal. Uh, they don't have to lime, of course, their, uh, their substrate uh, as the biochar is doing part of the liming. And one of the essential parts here is, of course, um, peat areas, when they grow, they can take in more CO2 than a tropical rainforest. So in our area, we don't have tropical rainforest, but we do have peat areas. 
And if we would leave the peat in place, of course, they could as well be a, um, a carbon sink doing part of the climate change mitigation. So what did 10 years of biochar R&D teach us so far? Uh, well, over the time, we tested four different technologies with many feedstock and analyzed many biochars. So here you see our smallest one, which is an OJ screw reactor. So biochar come, uh, sorry, biomass comes in here, and then it travels with a rotating screw uh, up to this point where the biochar is released and the gas is taken away. Um, we've also tried moving beds, which is basically a funnel, which is filled in from the top and then uh, slowly sinks to the bottom where it's ready. And in the meantime, it's heated both by the surface and by the gas that is going through it. We've been using bubbling fluidized bed for quite a while and also scaled that up. And uh, recently we moved uh, to a moving grade reactor, which is very common in biomass combustion. And the bottom line is you can make a good biochar with all of them. That's, that's not a discriminating factor, the technology. Um, it's not limiting the potential quality and it is the knowledge of the operator and the ingoing feedstock which determine the quality more than anything else. So very critical for the quality are the constant temperature, uh, sufficient but also constant residence times and clean enough uh, feedstock. So these are also not determining by itself um, if it's going to be a success. And I think um, focusing on economy of scale to go for larger volumes and lower cost price is in the end the way to go. So how does that affect our choices? First a bit on the quality of the biochar still. Um, we gradually managed to reduce the PAH levels, TARS, some people call them polyaromatic hydrocarbons, uh, below the one milligram per kilogram. Uh, that is very easy for us in the small scale uh, uh, rig, but also recently in the pilot scale, we've been managing very good uh, uh, pH uh, levels. This is the sum of the one cc uh, listed here. Um, uh, we have had good porosities, which mainly depend on the feedstock and sufficient residence time. The heavy metal content always depends on the feedstock and uh, we never encounter any problems with dioxins or furans. So, um, yeah, I think you can say that once you know how to do it, it is possible to get a good quality biochar. Then this is an LCA, which re requires a little bit of explanation. Um, it's an example uh, of uh, one of our projects with uh, the biochar as a peat replacement in the substrates and the natural gas being replaced uh, by the, the gas that uh, is produced in, the, in our biochar production unit, uh, in theory, because we don't have, we are, we're only up to a half a megawatt scale so far. So what you see here is a heated crop, strawberries, and on the left side, you see the kilogram of CO2 equivalents that are necessary per kilogram of strawberries. And there you can see <laughs> that unfortunately in our climate part of the world, we need five kilograms of CO2 equivalents to produce one kilogram of strawberries. It's remarkable. And um, this is the case where the yellow is peat. Uh, the blue is the energy that is needed. Uh, the green is uh, for the production of the fertilizer. Um, and then there is a little bit of red, uh, which uh, sums up the, the rest. And the reason that for these cases where you have uh, uh, biochar, uh, that this CO2 equivalent comes down so enormously is by two things. Um, the blue is much smaller, which is uh, the bio uh, energy replacing natural gas, uh, which is the case in all cases. But we've looked at two different uh, production facilities. One smaller one, which we call pyrochar here, uh, which is both smaller and um, producing less energy, more biochar. And the other one is uh, what we call an NHR. So it, it's 80% energy, 20% biochar production uh, at somewhat higher temperatures. And uh, what you see is that um, 
of course, the blue is here even smaller because we produce more energy, less biochar. Uh, but for the biochar produced, it's also produced at higher temperatures. And therefore, if you store this material, this substrate, after using the greenhouse in full soil, there is a sequestration part. So there it's, that's why it's because it's below zero. And um, the figures in here, they give the net value. So you can see that, for instance, for this case, we've calculated that you know, for a large scale installation, uh, standing next to some uh, greenhouse uh, acres, there you can see that you can go from five kilograms of CO2 for a kilogram of strawberries to virtually zero. So I think this is a bit, big achievement and it can show you that there are ways to reduce your food mark, uh, a CO2 uh, footprint. Um, so the technologies then in scaling up and cost price reduction. So we've, we've evaluated the four that we've studied. Uh, there are more, definitely. And with some sort of the main positive points, the main negative points, and uh, we come up with a conclusion of what we wanted to put our effort and time in to scale up. So this uh, screw reactor, it could also be a rotating drum. And the main positive point, I think, is it's easy and it's very reliable. And uh, it's very nice for limited amount of volumes and uh, for R&D and also maybe for specialties, which also comes down to limited volumes. The main negative points are the heat transfer. So once you start making this bigger, both in length and not necessarily in length, but in, in diameter, there you have the heat transfer, which is you know, not as good because your volume to surface ratio is increasing. So more volume, less surface, and the heat transfer is very often via the sites. Or if you have some heated streams, they might find uh, a quick way uh, for the gases to go through. And uh, the heat transfer might be uh, yeah, not, not as good as in some other technologies. So then we have a moving bed, say the funnel being completely filled. And uh, you, you fill it in from the top and it's coming out from the bottom. So this is very often low investment costs um, in general. It's, but it's very critical on uh, poor distribution. So if you have uh, wood fragments, that's fine. Um, but if you have other, other substances or if they can be compressed, uh, it's very difficult. Or if it doesn't have any weight, for instance, if you have grasses or so, it's, it's very difficult to make it move down. Uh, so the, the form and shape of the feedstock matter uh, and the heat transfer and uh, the limited size are also uh, main negative points in our point of view, uh, if, if your aim is scaling up, eh, that is. Um, so for us, this was the most difficult of the four technologies we tried. Then we have a fluidized bed. So this is sand bed in motion, kept in motion by gas streams. And this whole technology is developed for its very good uh, conversion and heat distribution. So the, the gas streams and the, the bubbling fluidized bed uh, make sure that the heat is distributed well uh, compared to the other eh? It's all relative to each other. And uh, the conversion of your feedstock is very good. And it was so good that <laughs> it resulted in relatively low yields. Um, so it, its main positive point was at the same time for the biochar production, also its main negative point. Um, although we managed quite well in a smaller scale, uh, a number of uh, 100 kilowatts uh, was, was fine. But once we build it uh, to half a megawatt, um, it, it really didn't work. So this concept uh, couldn't um, stand the test of scaling up um, because we had far more, uh, yeah, uh, heat. Um, no, the biomass was being dragged in and was converted, and uh, in the end, we had were left with very little uh, biochar. Say we we managed uh, four to five percent, but that's not good enough. So um, in the end, we decided on uh, the moving rate because it's suitable for uh, all sorts of feedstock. Mm -hmm. um, 
is good process control, both in the temperatures and in the uh, residence time. And it's very easy to scale up. This is very conventional technology. It's, I think it's the most common used technology in biomass combustion, so burning it all. And um, therefore, there are many technology providers, except that none of them work on the gasification. Um, well, uh, how to put this? A lot of them work on what they say gasification, working at the lambda of 0.8. So that is only uh, slightly oxygen deficient, but that's not good enough for making a good biochar. So making it at deep, much deeper staging uh, gasification, you have to make it gas tight and you have to start a learning process on all the gas streams and its optimization. Still, this is our choice um, because it's cost effective for the larger scale. And um, we were also uh, negotiating maybe a larger um, installation for a, a party that wanted also the bioenergy. So they stepped into it for the bioenergy and they wanted to make biochar as well. And uh, to avoid the too high risks, uh, for them, it was definitely uh, a very uh, good uh, option that you could go to 100% combustion as a fallback option and thereby reduce the risk. Um, this is a, a possible way of, of convincing people that need the bioenergy that they could go for the biochar option, limit the risk and, and still be able to go to 100% uh, energy. So um, this is our concept. It's built for half a megawatt. And this is the, the, the computer screen, screen dump. Um, so what you see here is a screw that is feeding into the reactor. And then here at the very low bottom part, you have a, uh, a grate. It's not, not very large. Um, and the gas that is coming off is, is burned here by the secondary air. And then we have a cooler in the top for energy uh, generation. So it's, it's well controlled residence time, it's good mixing, and it's proven and robust. So um, we, we um, have a well controlled heating of the product by, by radiation burners, um, utilization of internally produced gas, so no external heat supply in whatever form and uh, residual gas available for heat or syngas production because you make a burnable gas. It's a lot of CO and um, uh, hydrogen. Uh, well, that's not too high, but it's a burnable gas that can be upgraded as well. We've proven it that uh, 30 kilograms per hour um, using various feedstock and uh, running them in, uh, in shifts, so a day and night shift for 100 hours uh, continuous testing because this is three stories high, don't be mistaken. So it's, uh, there is a, uh, a ceiling somewhere here and there is a ceiling around here. So three stories high, do a lot of walking up and down the stairs uh, if you operate. Um, and we're now starting the uh, collaboration with experienced biomass boiler manufacturers for further scale up. So um, how do we foresee this concept at the greenhouse location? Well, first of all, I think it's good to notice that you don't have to choose for bioenergy or biochar or CO2 capture or carbon sequestration. You could have it all. So you start with the bioresidues, you feed them into this installation. Here you have the grade slowly moving down, and then you harvest your biochar, uh, which we managed to have no tars and very stable carbon, fairly say 600, 650 degrees C operating temperature, then this biochar can first be used as a peat replacement in potting soil. And after use, it can be used for carbon storage. At the same time, you produce a lot of energy from the burnable gas, which you can use for heat and electricity. But also you have CO2 coming out of the chimney. And we had a, a bio CO2 um, project where we cleaned up the gas, um, used the, not only taking out the dust, but also had a catalytic denox. And we had a check on the last um, pollutants that could potentially be uh, hormone, plant hormones like ethylene. So that has to go down to PPB levels, but it's, 
perfectly doable. We had uh, trials at uh, Wageningen with this gas. Somebody is shipping uh, in a car 15 cubic meters of gas from this from a real installation, real biomass installation, um, to uh, small greenhouses where we grew uh, sweet peppers on them. So the CO2 as a gaseous fertilizer is definitely, if you make it clean enough, the gas, uh, also one of the potential revenues. So then I'll show you um, one potential uh, example of the cost price. And, and I know this is sensitive to every figure that you put in. <laughs> so let me explain some of them because they determine, of course, also the outcome. First of all, it's fairly large. It's a 15 megawatt thermal input uh, installation, and it's for 8,000 hours per year of heat use. So it's at an industrial location. Then um, uh, this is a case without subsidy, but we've tried to put in carbon credits. So it's a bit based on the future scenario. Uh, because I know in the US, it's starting off with the, the carbon credits in Europe, it's still, a, we have some regional uh, examples, but not on a big scale yet. Uh, we put in a high price for the biochar, uh, sorry, for the biomass input, uh, I think. For some people, this is not high, for some it is. Um, and this price has an enormous impact. And this you can see here. Let me explain you a little bit of this graph. This is a conventional uh, biomass combustion installation. And here you see the stacking of the costs. And here you see the stacking of the benefits. And, the stacking, and in the stacking of the costs in the green, you see the biomass price. So that is... It, by the time it's 100 euros per ton, that is determining a fair bit of your cost price. And I know that if you are a green collector and you uh, you get uh, some uh, some fee for it to go and collect it, you might go after some sorting and, and, and bring it down in size. You might go to 30, and then that makes all of a difference, of course. Then in the revenues case, um, you see that the heat is a big part. I have to say that here we've taken a, quite a high value for the heat because there was a local uh, example where that was applicable, high temperature heat and, and used for steam. And um, if you are a big installation, you could have additional benefits from an ETS trading system. So the ETS trading system we've taken here for 50 euros per ton. By now that is right, uh, well above it, but well, <laughs> you have to start somewhere. And the, the target is uh, in Europe to have it at 20, 30, at 100 euros per ton, but uh, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if by that time it's above it. So that is the, the green, the CO2 trading 50 euros per ton. So this is conventional biomass combustion. Then what if we would go for our NHR concept? And there you can see that uh, we have slightly higher capital costs, although we think it doesn't have to be all that much more expensive. Uh, we also have a bit more variable cost. Uh, maybe you need yeah, some additional uh, storage or some um, um, sprinkler installation extra. Um, and uh, you see that um, uh, of the benefits, the heat is less because you produce less heat. Uh, part of it is uh, biochar, but if you add up the two, that, that is higher than, than just the heat from the combustion. What we've added up here as well is, uh, again, the CO2 for uh, trading of the ETS system, and then maybe also some uh, carbon credits, which is in blue, uh, for the storage of the biochar after use. And uh, you might think this is not really uh, feasible economically, but uh, please consider that in here, in the capital cost, there is already internal rate of return of 15%. So the 15% is already your profit on, in, uh, on your investment. And then if you would have a recovery of heat uh, and use the waste heat for drying your biomass, you're definitely uh, more than profitable. So 
we think this is a potential way to go. Um, the high end at the uh, replacing of uh, natural gas at the greenhouses in Holland is uh, potentially a very good one to start with to make larger quantities of biochar and in the end still be able to uh, use them for carbon storage in soil. So all in all, I think the future for co-production of biochar and bioenergy is looking bright. Um, and certainly as by July 16th of this year, biochar can be used in the fertilizer mix to improve soil and replace peat in potting soil. So there you don't have to uh, do any additional uh, administration. It is allowed if you uh, if you follow the standard for the biochar. So the biochar has to be of sufficient quality. Um, the EU carbon credits for biochar as a soil application are likely to be introduced in the near future. And many industrial applications where the biocarbon can replace fossil C are also looking into this. Uh, the larger volume needed and the bulk application require a cost price reduction because otherwise I don't foresee a lot of people wanting to buy it. And this can be achieved by the economy of scale, the co-production with energy generation and the stacking of revenues for this energy, uh, the biochar use, the carbon credits and uh, the ETS CO2 uh, uh, revenues. And the quality of biochar remains an important factor for success. Let's hope nobody will spoil the market by uh, bringing uh, really horrible stuff in the in soil and, and people turning against it. And um, yeah, we think that our concept, although we know there is many other uh, useful concepts, and I think the biochar market is big enough, um, but we consider our concept to be ready to go to the market as it fits all these requirements. So it it's scalable and it's a cheap uh, combination with the, the combustion technology uh, and we're using it to gasify on a grade as the design principle. So uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, hopefully you have some questions for me. Thank you very much, Jan. This was very interesting, really interesting concept um, of the inner chart. Um, I think you already got a couple of questions. Uh, I just want to jump in with uh, two for myself first. Um, my, my first question would be, um, so did you look at that uh, with another feedstock, not wood chips, because I would assume that in the Netherlands, wood chips are not the most sustainable feedstock? Uh, yeah, we've done a hundred hours test uh, a few weeks ago with cocoa shells. And you think cocoa might not be very local, but it is because we have a lot, uh, a large uh, chocolate industry uh, coming into the Amsterdam Harbor. And uh, the cocoa shells are the small shells that are uh, uh, protecting the, the cocoa bean. So there's a huge uh, volume. And uh, there was a big uh, worldwide uh, food processor who wanted to make biochar of it. Um, we went quite far and uh, we had good hopes of selling them uh, an installation with a technology provider in a consortium but they decided they want to produce the biochar in Ivory Coast so there was headquarters deciding over local uh, people um, well hopefully it will be built somewhere <laughs> but uh, probably not ours then uh, it, for Africa it's uh, maybe yeah a giant step to do this right away so um, and my second question would be, so, so you assume the price of 350 uh, euro per ton of biochar. Um, is that for, assumed for peat replacement biochar or? The 350, yeah, sorry, I didn't uh, stress this. Um, somewhere in the calculations, we went for the 350 euros per ton. Yes, that is as a peat replacement. Uh, and that's a, that's a um, um, competitive price for peat replacement. It is com not completely competitive, but uh, we think, um, and nobody gives us a, a hard guarantee, but we know that somewhere uh, the price for the peat and the, uh, the liming and uh, making it into a good blend and everything would be somewhere in the 200, 250s. And, and, um, but these people are aware that they have to get rid of the, 
the peat in their plants. And they think that uh, consumers would be, or growers would be prepared to pay this price. Um, although nobody will give you this on paper. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you. Um, and so we go to the questions from the chat. Um, so Matthew uh, was asking, what is the size at which you would consider an operation to be scaled up? So what do you mean by scaling up? What is a large scale for you? That's difficult to say. <laughs> it's a relative uh, term, of course. Um, yeah. I think at uh, the scale at which you can be uh, economically viable. Um, so if your biomass is, is a lot cheaper, your installation can also be smaller. So we, we've really looked at the economic pricing and economic viability, first of all. And then, then look at either how much money the biochar had to cost or how small you could make your, your installation. So I guess if your biochar price comes really down, um, now if your biomass price comes down, then probably also your biochar price comes down. Uh, thinking that if it wasn't uh, as good as from clean wood, uh, you probably won't get the same. Mm. So this 50 megawatt, I think, is in the range where uh, on the most circumstances without subsidy, it would be economically viable. But it very much depends on, on your local conditions as well. Um. Dan was asking uh, if the gases are condensed, are useful oils produced? So is there, I, I guess in your system with the secondary air introduction, you won't have any tars, tar no. collection possibility? No, because we burn everything. And of course, in we also have a big gasification group and they look into, um, you know, different uh, uses for the different compounds in the gas. Um, so in the end, they might as try to do something else with the gas, but for the moment, um, you know, burning it and making energy from it is, I think, a, uh, well, very conventional and, and first step into the market that makes it feasible a lot easier, uh, a lot quicker, yeah. Um, and then you get the question that I'm sure you like um, about the uh, love for hydrogen. So could the gases be further refined to produce cleaner hydrogen or other gases? Um, yeah, we're, we are going to do some restructuring in the in the coming months. And uh, the restructuring is to see what we can achieve at higher temperatures. So we want to go and see what happens if we move to between 800 and 1000 uh, C. And then, um, then we also have the potential to start making a lot more hydrogen. And then you would also look for different applications of the gas. Yeah, I think in theory, we still have to prove that. But in theory, you might go to 40% of hydrogen in the gas at 1,000 degrees. OK, so uh, two last questions, because we cannot answer all of them. Otherwise, we are far over time. The first one was, um, when you mentioned CO2 storage, the price per ton is for CO2 equivalent, I just. So what is the price for CO2 per biochar? Trading by volume and char particular size? Question mark. <laughs> Um, then you have to do the calculation that um, uh, the biochar is the carbon and the CO2 equivalent, you can uh, multiply by 3.8 and then uh, that's for the oxygen being in the CO2. And then, of course, uh, after 100 years, you don't have everything left. So there is a percentage you have to assume uh, being present after 100 years say it's uh, 80% or so. So um, yeah, that still would give you a very nice price for your biochar uh, in terms of storage, yeah. Um, and the last question from Marie Silva, uh, did you look at uh, different uh, heating methods, for example, microwave um, uh, pyrosis? No, no, we didn't. No, we, we, we just uh, use a little bit of the gas that is produced in the internal process, but very quickly, once we start uh, having this uh, burning of the gas, we have radiation heat. And uh, I think it's very efficient. This is also part of the concept where we, uh, we, we patented something in the design. Yeah. 
Okay, great. Um, so thank you very much, Ian. Very nice yeah, interview presentation. Um, if you have any more questions, you can see the um, email address on the on your screen right now. And if you just want to watch through it again, um, it will be uploaded in a couple of days on our website. Um,